Hi, it's John Murphy here, and today's guest on the Winning Teams podcast is Jar- Charlie Valher, who hails from Melbourne in Australia. Now, Charlie is the founder of a company called Outsourcing Angel and also of Valor Media. But what we're focusing on the podcast today is his experience with the outsourcing world. And, you know, anybody who is really looking to grow their teams really should be looking at this outsourcing model. And Charlie's got a lot of experience in this, and uh, not only in terms of providing uh, out, uh, external resources to organizations, but also <clears throat> of managing quite a large team himself. And today's podcast is focusing a lot on how do you actually manage that outsource team? How do you really create a team that is aligned? How do you actually manage the culture? And how do you retain those people? And there's a lot of strategies in there that Charlie will cover that really will help you to do that. So uh, tune in and listen to Charlie. He's got some fascinating stuff and really interesting uh, thoughts and perceptions upon why you should be going down the outsourcing route. And they're not just all for financial reasons. There's a lot more reasons and very sound commercial reasons why you should be doing it as well. If you're looking for more tips, then go to my site, www.johnmurphyinternational.com, where you can download a short book that I wrote, The 10 Key Traits of Top Business Leaders, which will really help you on your leadership journey. But in the meantime, sit back and listen to Charlie and really explore the whole outsourcing world. Charlie, thank you for taking the time to be with me today on the Winning Teams podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. No, I said we're from in different parts of the world. You're in Melbourne. I'm here in France. But just to talk about your your business, Valor Media. I mean, you've, you've had that, that business for a while. You've been in business for quite a long time. And you had originally started um, like an outsourcing business. And I want to talk about, you know, that kind of trend, what's happening, where people are looking to outsource and help people. But the challenges and, you know, because my work is all about, you know, teams and, and how you actually build effective teams. That is a challenge, isn't it, when it comes to uh, having teams that are outsourced, they're in different locations, they're in different locations from you, they're in different locations from each other. So how do you go about actually managing that? And what are the things you put in place to make sure that you are actually building a team? Because it's not just a collection of individuals who are doing, you know, kind of various and different tasks. They've got to come together to be a cohesive team. I love so many parts of what you just said, John. Because in all honesty, if you're a small team, so yourself and maybe one or two others, you really can be individuals. Like there's actually no collaboration if it really required or management level. It's um, quite simple. But once you go past, let's say, eight or you go into the territory of 12 or you go to really big territory of like 25 plus, that changes uh, tremendously. And like the amount of communication you need between each other, the amount of management and QAs is very, very different. So I, I really like that a lot. And I think having a virtual team particularly has unique challenges uh, and unique strengths versus, let's say, having a local team. And some people definitely are more suited towards one or the other. But to take things back a step and, and really kind of think about how this came to me, when I first got online, the first thing I actually did is I had a marketing agency and I was very much struggling to compete against the bigger agencies in Australia. So um, I was going in there and these guys had massive offices floors of people, floors of like top grade talent. And uh, here here was Charlie trying to work out how he's going to crack this code. And I remember getting on Seek and looking at how much it was going to cost me. Seek is like a job site in Australia. You know, the name Seek, not bad. Give them the branding. But um, I was looking at this and I was like, right, it's going to cost me $80,000 a year for the employee I I need. I broke it down and I looked at these numbers and then I looked at my bank account and thought, I'm not doing something right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, I need to find a solution to be competitive, like, or we're just never going to get this business off the ground. 
Um, and I had a good friend at the time, Lynn, who will come into this story uh, sooner, and she's been a previous guest on this podcast. But Lynn was someone I had met who had been doing things offshore. She'd been hiring people from the Philippines. She'd been hiring people um, from all over the world. And she really opened my eyes to this concept of like, because of the internet, having people in an office near you, like those days are numbered. And as much as I thought this was kind of crazy, I thought this was like, you know, at, at this point, I thought maybe she's drunk. Like what drugs <laughs> is she taking? Uh, this seems ludicrous. And she kind of convinced me. She's a very passionate person and um, very convincing and persuasive. But I could see yes, this. She is. Her I, I, she is. I have. I have spoken to her, and, I, and uh, she's been on the podcast. And I can absolutely agree. She is passionate and convincing. She's got some magic about her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I was very drawn to it. So, like in this scenario, I was like, well, in my current position, like this is the young, much younger version of myself um, here, and looking at this, I was like. I've got the option of either going into debt to try and bring on the employees I want, or there's this other option over here. It's new, it's different. And I'll tell you what, I've seen what's happened to Kodak in the yellow pages. New and different is what's going on. I'm going to go this route. I'm going to step out of what I perceive is the comfort zone with team. Now, at this point, virtual assistants and VAs, very new thing. But to my, I suppose, to my delight, it worked. It worked really, really well. And me and Lynn, I hired more people with Lynn. Lynn started becoming a really good friend and then we birthed Outsourcing Angel together. Now, Lynn had already been doing a little bit of stuff, but ultimately we co-founded Outsourcing Angel and like it, it took off and this was a trend we got in front of. Now, I'd like to pretend I was some sort of genius and that I picked this trend early on and you know, it was all, my, it was all me. Like I knew this was coming. This was great positioning as a company, but uh, this is probably more casino where it was just pure, pure luck. <laughs> <laughs> just right time, right place, and just happened to know Lynn. Um, on the back of that, you know, leaning into my story here, many people were feeling the same way. We were coming across small business owners all over the shop going, local talent, particularly in Australia, was incredibly expensive and we needed to find solutions um, or ways of being competitive. And that's kind of the way we approached it. Uh, many year late, years later, the company got bigger. Um, it took off and is still a, what I would call a juggernaut where it's like it's crossed, you know, a hundred staff at some points. So a very, very nice business and a fun business to be a part of. It's it's interesting, isn't it, that you, you're talking about, you know, if we're being, uh, being for small businesses and medium sized businesses, but it's very interesting. I, I one of the, the clients that I have is a, is a major um, global organization. And in a conversation recently, um, they were saying, oh, you know, and, and a particular, particular piece of work that they want to do, and and I discovered that in actual fact for, you know, when they want to get some a bit of research done and then they want to, you know, presentations put together and slide decks put together, I, I would have made the assumption that they were doing all of that in-house because they're big enough, huge enough to actually do that. But in actual fact, they outsource that. So here's a major organization with all of the the financial muscle but they're finding it a much more effective and efficient way of doing it to outsource that sort of specialized uh, piece of work. I just thought that was interesting. So it's not people tend to think that outsourcing is for kind of startups and kind of early stage, but in actual fact, that's not the case, is it? Not anymore. Like this is many years ago when we kind of started, but um, like the big corporations are clever. They've got fantastic people working there, very skilled people. Like eventually they got onto it, so to speak, or my my take on the situation is like they started to see this change. And like today you can see massive companies like Microsoft, um, Google, uh, Deloitte's, like they all have offices in the Philippines and parts of the world now. I'm sure all over the globe because they're aware of this. So yeah. absolutely outsourcing is happening. And then in the massive scale, they're just going over there and setting up buildings. Because yeah. they can, yeah. So when you're looking at, I mean, for your own business, I know that you you've got, you know, with, within your own business and Valor Media, you've got a number of people that you outsource in, in different areas. How do you then get that to become a cohesive team and shift from being a just a group of individuals? Yeah, that, I mean, that's, I love that question in the beginning because it's such an interesting point and something I've had to put a lot of effort into. So, you know, earlier versions of myself was like, I used to joke and say that I ran an adult daycare center. That's how I would describe <laughs> what I did for a living. Um, and thank you for laughing at that joke because it is yeah. funny, but true. very, very yeah. true. That was the reality. 
and I had a service, like, you know, I have a service business even today. So the reality is I felt like I was going to work dealing with client challenges and then dealing with team challenges. And it was this, this never ending um, daycare center. Um, reality was, is that, you know, I didn't have the skills I have today. And I'll definitely cop it on the chin. It was a management issue and uh, my issue that I didn't know how to make this work together. So I came across this idea that what I was really struggling with um, was that I was still trying to be like, I'll use a sporting analogy because I think it's the best way to describe it, is the way I was behaving is I was behaving like the captain of the football team. So I was on the field and I was with the players and I was trying to lead them from being on the field. But what they really needed was a coach. They needed someone that was sitting on the side of the field that was helping set up the game plan. And, and the way I kind of thought about it or what really triggered it for me is like, the captain of the field, he's in the game and he's making in-game decisions. So like he's really good at like, you know, pass the ball, kick him, or he can get his hands in there and like, you know, make a kick or whatever needs to happen to win the game. But the coach, he's got a he's got a very different role. Like the way a coach has an impact on the game is actually before the game, in the timeouts, at the halftime, and then after the game in the review. And for him to be successful, it like requires a completely different skill set. So I really invested in like trying to understand that skill set because there was people out there in business that were clearly doing that, but I didn't know how to do that. So I sought out some people, um, one who we've spoken about in other times of Keith Cunningham was one I, I you know, found out about. And then I read a couple of really good books. One was called um, Scaling Up and then another was called Traction. And I realized that if we could get a good system for bringing people together, that it would obviously take a lot of the pressure off the day-to-day -day management because we'd have something to lean on, like a set of rules and a playbook and a strategy to go with. Now, I did tweak, and I know you shouldn't, you know, the systems are good, but I did have to put some tweaks on it because I felt like a lot of the stuff they covered wasn't designed for virtual. A lot of the stuff they were doing made the assumption you were all in a boardroom together or had the ability to, you know, go tap people on the shoulder or talk at the water cooler. And like, we didn't have any of that. <laughs> So I was going, okay, well, how am I going to do this? And, and ultimately, I came with this system, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly here, um, which was called Winning the Week. And what I decided is like, you know, I wanted to be this coach and the game we were trying to win was the week. If we could win Monday to Friday and do that consistently, like life was going to be a lot better for us. So I set up a strategy of like, you know, Monday at the start of Monday is our pregame meeting. This is where we're going to put the work, you know, where the players are going to be on the court, what their expectations are. Um, you know, we're going to talk through what the week needs to look like to win. It's the plan. Across Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we have a little check-in, which is, you know, commonly referred to as like a daily huddle. And basically what we're looking for is feedback from the players to be like, you know, are we on track or not on track to win this game? So it's really quick. Um, it's just making sure that we're on track from the plan we set on Monday. And then on Friday is all about like after game. Like how did we play this week? Were there challenges or obstacles we need to come overcome? Um, like essentially assessing and reviewing for improvement. And as we started to do this week on week um, with this type of system, I really noticed that that's how we were able to bring together. And that's how we were able to scale the team. So now that we bring more people into that, everyone's accountable to each other. It's, it's made a huge impact. And those Monday and Friday meetings, so, so crucial when you don't have that in-person aspect. Yeah. And I mean, I like that because I think that's, that's actually giving a very solid uh, structure and process. And, and I know that you're very much a, a, a process person. And I, and I want to come back and talk to you because I, I have a kind of a sneaking envy of you being that good at process. Process is something that I, I have to actually work hard at. But if you look at that, the structure you're talking about that, that's very much around the things that we've got to do, the tasks that we've got to do, the actions we've got to take and, and the results we've got to deliver, which is great and, and very, very important. The other part of coaching, though, is getting the culture right and getting people aligned to an overall vision. Um, and also, if I can add another part to the coaching element, is actually helping people find their own solutions rather than being directive and telling them. How do you manage to actually get a culture with a team that is, you know, they could be working from home, they could be working from some offices, whatever they might be, but they're in diverse locations. How do you manage to actually create that culture within that team rather than just having it as a, a functional uh, operating model? Yeah, it's a really, really interesting point. I think I was probably um, 
This is something I've really missed the importance of in the early days of business. I think my biggest challenge with that is like I'm quite introverted um, and quite regimented. And when I took that approach of just like, you know, only communicating with people very directly and like not having a culture, it's funny how it turns toxic pretty quick because when you're not in the same room as someone, like they can make assumptions that you might be mad at them or that you're not talking to them for a reason or something like that, which could be completely false and probably was, but it's very dangerous and different to fall that off track when compared to like a real life office. So there's a few things I've really looked at and I've tried many things over the years is one is we definitely take advantage of some of the tools available today. Um, mostly for culture is where we talk about Slack. So Slack is an amazing way to keep communication heights, like an in instant messaging tool like Skype, for those, of, those that may not know. Um, and we definitely lean on that for culture building. And when we use that platform, when you've got that communication channel, that's where the opportunity to communicate culture and talk around these things is, is more important. So yes, I, I definitely think that culture is very, very important here. But the other side of it is, is I've really come to the idea of like, when you're setting a culture, like achievement is really one part of it, like we're here to get a job done, but there has to be elements of, I suppose, a little bit of fun or sparkle to it, like having it an enjoyable place to work with and the right people on that team. But that's where we've kind of brought those elements in together to create more. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. This was a really interesting one we did a few years back where we did footy tipping um, for, so Australian rules footy tipping for a Filipino company. But they've got, they've never seen this game before and they're just making guesses and all the rest. And just side note, the person who won uh, based their results on which animal she thought would win in the fight and tipped the whole year in advance. So if it was like dog versus cat, which would be like the dogs would beat the cat. Um, fascinating scenario. But little things like that that brought an element of understanding each other's cultures definitely played a role. Having reasons to communicate outside of just work. I'm not saying we're not important in work here, but definitely having that element where they can see we're real people and they are a real person here. And then lastly, having in-person events. So even though we are all over the world, like we do like to bring our people together ideally once a year when travel is ideal, sometimes that can be a little bit more challenging, but that certainly played an element as well. Okay. Can I ask you just in regard to using Slack? I'm interested because you said that you use it for developing culture. And my interpretation of the use of Slack is that it's much more about a task management tool. And that's how I've seen it being utilized. So you use it, you obviously use it slightly differently. And I'm just curious as to, how you're using it to develop the culture as opposed to just kind of sharing tasks and work that's going on. It definitely can be used for both. I won't even pretend it can't. Like just like any messaging tool, we could use Facebook Messenger for business if we wanted to. Like it's, it's less about the tool and how and more about how you use it is, is how I think about it. So for us, I'll, I'll go through this briefly. Is like we use Asana to manage projects. But when we're trying to like, you know, this needs to be done by when, that's going in Asana. That's how we track all our projects. That's how we use our Kanban boards, how we set up tasks. Like it's accountable to timelines. Everything happens in there. Slack is more about the quicker communication and more instant communication. It may be related to some of those projects or details on a project, but ultimately it's, I kind of think about some of the channels we have on Slack, like our general channel is like our water cooler. So if you right. imagine we okay. have a virtual office, that yeah. general Slack channel is where you know, we're updating things. I mean, I have a three month old uh, son. I uploaded a photo of my three month old, like I'm, you know, pinning up a photo above the water cooler. Um, yeah. And we, we really encourage a bit of that communication as well. Okay, so it does work for, on, on that basis. Can I talk about the, um, and you touched on it there, and this is the, the cultural differences. Um, because, you know, we, when you're actually looking at outsourcing and whether, you know, it's the Philippines or wherever it might be, because it's not, you know, we talked about the Philippines, but obviously you can outsource to places other than the Philippines. But how do you, how do you overcome the cultural differences? And how do you, I mean, because you've got to be aware of it and, you know, and it's an issue that you've got to manage. And I, I mean, I, I work with a lot of major companies where, you know, there is, you know, kind of the people in different countries, different continents, and you can see that, that, you know, cultural challenges play out in, in teams, but they tend to be where they, you know, they're more kind of physically in contact with each other. How do you do it with virtual teams? How do you manage those cultural differences with virtual teams? 
Yeah, there's been there's been some really interesting ones over the years. Now I must say I'm probably desensitized to it by now. I've been doing it for so long that I just think about this is how work is. Um, I think what you really have to go into it is just a very real understanding that wherever you are is likely very different to another country. We, most of us have traveled. I'm assuming a lot of the people that listen to this will have. And I'm sure you've even noticed a lot of a difference between France um, and probably Australia, where I know you traveled uh, not long ago. Yeah. I always like to go in very open um, and tolerable. And then I always like to try and pay attention to things. And I think one of the things that really kind of caught me from here is that if you see something, look to understand it before you judge it. So what's some of the ones? I suppose communications like is probably one of the bigger ones in like how we view the world and what the world's like. Like I think particularly in Australia, we take a lot of things for granted um, by standard where it would be like an amazing thing where in the Philippines it may not be so. So we might be saying we're angry about something that they would dream of. So these types of things I really watch for in my own behavior um, because I, I feel like that could drive envy or that could drive and make me seem like a spoiled brat when I'm not. Um, so there's the things we kind of have a look at from there. Apart from that, I think the bigger ones to be really cautious of is religious ones. So um, in Australia, I wouldn't consider us an overly religious country. Yes, there is a lot of religion, but um, I wouldn't say that there's a huge amount of like, you know, religious following. I actually think people have more Christmas and Easter off for the commercial aspect than the religious following in Australia. But in the Philippines, particularly this is where I have a lot of experience, um, they are tend to be take religion a bit more seriously than we do. So there's some there you really need to be aware of um, on that point of view. I always find the cultural differences. And I think that, you know, I, I, as, as you know, I do work in Australia, but I do work in the US. And, and you find that sometimes people uh, you know, in Australia and the US, see Europe as kind of one block, and in actual fact, it's 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 kind of fascinating. I, I did some work uh, recently with a, a, a company where they've got, you know, within it they've got a, a business in 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 France and they've got a, a business in Holland, right? Now geographically they are you know right beside each other, right? But in terms of culture, it is just so different, and in terms of the way they communicate and the way they deal with communication is so different and just getting that kind of finding that understanding of each other uh, rather than actually just seeing the difference is a, a, can be a big challenge but one of the other issues that that um that i've seen and and and, and of experience in terms of virtue because of, you know I put my hand up i do have uh, virtual workers uh, in my own business is the whole process of onboarding so you know, and to an extent, if you've got an office, they come to your office and you can kind of put your arm around them and it's relatively straightforward. I know that there's more to it than just putting your arm around them and welcoming them. There's got to be an onboarding process to that. But how do you deal with that with virtual, a new virtual team member joining you, you know, next Monday? How do you map out how they get onboarded and integrated into the team? So I think this is one of the things that suited my style a lot. I think why I've had a lot more success with virtual teams than a lot of people have is because of my systematic nature. Now, what I feel like is when people have a in-person business, or in real life we call it, IRL, uh, for short, that's what we, it's funny, us virtual teams, people call businesses that all operate in one room, IRLs. <laughs> um, anyway, a little industry term for you, that's one of our culture things. Um, but nonetheless, something I picked up on um, that I didn't necessarily notice until much deeper on is that when you have a virtual business, your reliance on systems is much higher than when you have a, an office with people in the same room. And the idea being is that if someone was next to me, it's easy for me to see if they've gone off track. It's easier for me to see if they're making a mistake or perhaps if they're struggling with something. But with that virtual wall, you don't get that advantage. So if, you're, if your systems aren't tight, or you don't have the measures in place to check in on someone regularly in a virtual role, they can go in the wrong direction for like three days and you'd have no idea. I once had a team member like uh, quit spontaneously because her workload was insane, but we just had no idea. We thought she was okay, but she was working nights and evenings just to try and uh, keep up, was working weekends. Again, we didn't know. Um, we'd never do that to someone intentionally. But she'd gotten into the habit of trying to meet, always trying to meet my expectation, which I appreciated, but it was it was like killing her. So those are the things you've really, really got to be aware of. So something that I think when it comes to virtual businesses, if you've got a virtual business, the chances is that a lot of your work is on the internet. 
And because of that, there's an amazing way of recording what you're doing. So what we decided as a company is that if we were going to be successful, we had to lean into systems. We had to really document how to do things well. We also have to train our team well if they're going to be successful with us. So when I go into like onboarding a virtual team member, number one, I mentioned this earlier, they're coming into the winning the week. Like they're getting set up with a good week. They know what's expected of them in the week and then they're getting reviewed at the end of the week. Number two is that you know when and what needs to be done is in Asana. So they know a good track and they're not trying to remember what I told them. Like they've got a place to go to. Okay, well, this is the next thing I need to do. And then lastly, it's like having good documentation, whether it's recorded on something like this, Blue Jeans, or using Loom, where we can actually record how to do something. So if they get stuck, that they can actually come across and go, oh, this is how I do it. And then finally, I say what's really important is having a bit of a buddy system. So everyone at my team now in Vela Media is like they've got someone to ask questions to, they've got someone they're accountable to or can get help or get things cross-checked. And when you hit that as kind of like a trifecta of onboarding someone well where they fall into that type of environment, then I just think you're setting them up to succeed uh, at a much higher level where routinely like what I see and commonly what I used to see at Outsourcing Angel is like an abandonment strategy. Like they'll hire the person and just give them tasks and like really not give them any support or ideas or anything from that. So that's kind of like the key difference where I think why I onboard well is because that's what we go to. One of the the, the issues that I know you hear people talk about when uh, when they talk about you know kind of hiring virtual teams is is the reliability factor in terms of that they turn up, um, but also is about how do you how do you retain them and how do you actually build that team for the longer term and um because i know even in my own experience i mean i've you know i had some false starts with with uh with hiring virtual uh, virtual um uh contractors um we're going through a very detailed process of interviewing various people and then selecting them and then they just didn't turn up uh, on the day they were meant to start, which is brutal, hard, very brutal, <laughs> which is heartbreaking when you've gone through the process of doing it. But, but it's also how do you actually make, build it? And people kind of have a sense that okay, well, people they're they're, they're going to come and go, and they're going to be there with you for a while, and they're going to be gone. And I mean, with any team, it's about you know you 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 leverage and you get the the value of that team when they 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 stay with you, and you're able to grow and develop them and get the benefit from them. So how do you actually retain? What are the things you do to retain and develop the team? Such a good question. I, I, what I looked at here was I was like, why do most people leave? That was the question I asked myself. Instead of like thinking about like, how do I keep them? Like, why do they leave? And ultimately, I looked at a few things where I said, if this is always the better decision, like if it's a better decision to work with me, then take on another opportunity. Why would anyone leave? Now, there are definitely some factors, and I have had like some of my greatest people leave, unfortunately, due to health. Like that's the only thing I could come up for this one is I was going to get all my team on an exercise and diet plan. Uh, but I thought that might be too far. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I looked at from there is like, you know, what, what are the main reasons people leave? And the one I looked at was like career development. I was saying if someone comes here and they feel like this is the end of the road, this is all they can ever learn, they're not going to be invested in. Like, why would they stay in that circumstance? So when I bring people on, as a part of the retention strategy is going like, where does this person want to go? What skills are they going to develop? And like, how can they progress? So if they feel that's available to them and that career development is there, like that's a really big thing. So we looked at that as number one. Number two, I was like, if I got treated like, well, I hope it's okay to swear, treated like shit every day. If I had an abusive boss, if you rained me over the coals every time I made a mistake, like, I'm pretty sure I would leave. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to be that type of leader. So if someone makes a mistake, like definitely bring it up. Let's not pretend it didn't happen, but approach it in a way where it can be amended with a system. We can learn from it and we can kind of change that from there. And then the third part I kind of thought about was money. And I'm like, if someone's like struggling to pay their bills, like really struggling, like I would leave. Like if it meant the difference between my wife looking being looked after, nothing else would matter. I would leave straight away because I would always look after my family before I would um, work a job. So paying well. And that was a really big thing for us as well is like, I never want to have a, an employee come to me and say, look, I'm out because someone's willing to double my wage. And I was like, wow, you know, like if we lean into these, that's going to be a really heavy part of why people stay. 
And then the last component was just work-life balance. Like we don't want to see crazy hours. I honestly think it's a huge mistake to have your staff working crazy hours because it's like this diminishing return. I'm, I'm really confident you can win this. Yeah, absolutely. Someone who works I mean, 60 hours. They're just not crazy. effective. I mean, they're just not effective. They will leave you. In terms of remuneration, when you touched on it there, do you look, okay, I mean, obviously you pay them, you know, their, their kind of hourly, weekly rate, whatever it might be, but do you look then to kind of incentivize them beyond the, the kind of the, 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 the weekly or hourly rate? That's a really good question as well. Um, we we do do a Christmas bonus. Um, yeah. That is something I look towards that we judge performance from there. What what I found, this is probably one of the cultural things um, we look at from there. So if I was going to hire an Australian, um, they they can be very well incentivized by money because that's can be a really big driver for an Australian. Um, in the Philippines, like there's probably different things that are more important now. This is another thing I looked at. In general, most people treat the Philippines employment community like crap. Like job security is a real big issue. Like you can have a job and then it's just gone. Yeah. It's like it's because of how many workers work directly with other companies. It's also really common to do work and just not get paid. So when I look for like the roles I like to create, and I, I literally interviewed someone before this and he he's like, I really want a job where I'm not worried that I'm going to get paid next week. Right. Okay. And yeah. I looked at that and I was like, stability is a really big driver here. So when I look at hiring, I make it very clear. One, you're full-time with me. I don't do part-time. I think it's a waste of time. I'm not going to train you well to work for someone else and get results there. I'm going to invest the effort. You're doing it here. And then two is, you know, the things I mentioned before about career development, training, like upskilling all come into it. Um, but then when we look at that is stability. It's like you're safe here. You don't have to worry about getting paid. You don't have to worry if there's a job next month. Like I've got your back on that. I will not pay myself before you don't get paid. Mm. And that's a really big driver with virtual teams. Yeah, and, and I think that's, you know, it just was struck me when you're saying that, that's also understanding the cultural differences, isn't it? I mean, because we, we make assumptions about what is what is expected. And it's always to check your own assumptions. Um, because certainly I found that, you know, depending on different parts of the world, you know, where, when you look at remuneration where you know additional incentives are you know a very big part of that and in other cultures in developed cultures you know they just see well why would you get a bonus because you're just there to do your job so you just get paid your salary and that's that's part of it that's that's perfectly acceptable so if you start talking about bonuses they're kind of looking at you kind of funny so i think it is that part of understanding the cultural differences a lot of people look at outsourcing as that it is, you know, financially efficient, which it is. And I mean, let's be very honest about that. But when you're looking at it as a way of building your business, what are the other benefits apart from financial that you would advocate somebody to go down the route of having a virtual team? And this is interesting. This is such an interesting question, right? If you asked me that question when we first started outsourcing Angel, I probably would have said, look, it's a financial play. You can hire three for the same price as one here. It's just the maths. I wouldn't make that comment anymore. I really wouldn't. I think this is one of the things that's changed a lot, particularly in the Philippines. So this is what I'll say is that what the talent is like five years ago to what it is today is drastically different. I can hire roles that I never could have hired um, back then at a really high standard. And the reason for that is because like you can imagine like there's people that have now had five years more experience. So that's been just such a huge driver. And I look at the way the Philippines particularly op operates in like the investment in high speed internet and infrastructure. Like they know like this is their biggest export market. This is like labor has just become a huge thing. So they've invested in it. I had a VA where she was really gutted because her kids don't know how to speak the native language because they're taught English in school because they know English is where it's at if you want to get a good job. So there's little things like that that have just led me to look at like how invested they are in this working out. And then the next component of it is like, and I say this and I will criticize my fellow Aussies, Filipinos will outwork you. They will absolutely outwork you. Um, and when you look at that, you might say, well, okay, let's look at the real thing here. You might have an Aussie that will work half as hard and want twice the wage. And when you look at that, you've got this new generation, particularly the younger ones, really surprised me. I could have a conversation with some of the particularly like young 20s Filip Filipinos 
and they sound like Westerners. Like they absolutely are embedded in the culture. They watch the same same TV shows because of like Netflix. They watch the same movies, but that gap has really, really um, shrunk. And I would almost question now is like particularly. I, I've just got this, and I'll mention this one from here. I've got a video editor, and he will smash anyone in the world. I'll, I'll put him against anyone. It's not a uh, you know is this a lesser talent exchange? This is like he's just good at any value. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I think that you know. So I and I agree with you. I think that they are, um, there are very good commercial reasons other than financial to actually have a virtual team because I, I you know my experience certainly has been that they are very um, dedicated, they're very reliable, um, and they are so eager to actually you know to actually deliver really exceptional uh, quality and are very open to taking direction is the other thing that I find is that they are, you know, it, it doesn't, you, they, they really do um, uh, expect it and they do want it and they're very receptive to it. And if you can show another way of doing something, I think that they really do take that on board. Uh, and there is that kind of, you get that sense of a, a hunger for knowledge and a hunger for expertise. And and that makes it it's so much easier. And I, I just find the, the reliability and loyalty uh, huge when you actually treat uh, treat them right. It's such a fascinating comment that high willingness to learn mixed with hunger is like ah, oh, it's like what you would look for in an A player. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I think it is fantastic. And um, Charlie, this has really been interesting. I, I I was going to go on and talk a little bit about um, kind of Valor Media, what you do with podcasting, but we've. We've spent quite a bit of time on this, and it's it's. And I would love to come back and maybe do another interview about the podcast and the role of podcasting in business. If you were up to doing that in the future, absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, I will do that. But listen, before I two questions I ask everybody: a book that's had a significant impact upon you. Definitely would be "The Road Less Stupid" by Keith Cunningham, my favorite book of all time. Why is that? It's it's is really there, I read there, a lot. Is there a hint in the title? Is there? <laughs> well, there definitely is. For the for those of you that don't know Keith Cunningham, what uh, amazes me about this guy is at a very young age, around forty, he was he had a hundred million dollars. He was that successful, and he lost it all, all of it, through poor decisions, and then got it back. Now, I, I don't know about you, but it's like I could put luck on a lot of people's side to do it once. But I think it's a rarity to find people that would do it twice. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to Keith's story and you go through the lessons of getting it once, losing it, and then getting it twice, and like at an astronomical level, we're not talking this guy made a million. This is a hundred million. Um, and then I just think he's a phenomenal storyteller in the way he articulates it. So it's one thing to be good at something, I think to have the skill to describe your situation thinking and how to change it in a way someone else can learn it and appreciate it and like do something with it is a real skill. So I think he's a bit of a unicorn and like crazy experience and a good teacher. So that's okay, why I that's, really like him. I have heard of him and I, but I've never read anything. So that will definitely go, go on my list. The other question I ask people about daily rituals. Now I know you well enough to know that because you're, a systems guy, you're a very regimented guy. I have no doubt that you have uh, daily rituals, uh, unless you're going to really surprise me, but I have no doubt that you do have daily rituals. Love to know what they are, if you're happy to share them, and why you have those ones and what they actually do for your day. Yeah, I'm very regimented. I am very systems focused. And just to give you just a little, uh, it's a little bit funny, but will describe a lot about me. I run my relationship in a system, like we run it like a business. We have a weekly meeting, we have KPIs for the family, we, we track things well and we have very good uh, financial management. My wife's an accountant, by the way. This is like the perfect mix of like a systemized sized guy with a numbers girl. Yeah. It's like it's, I, it's I, a match I, made in. <laughs> yeah, I, I get the whole thing about the financial management to be very regimented, but I mean, to, to manage your relationship on a spreadsheet? Absol absolutely, well, it's a few spreadsheets, <laughs> but like, um, well, I'll give you an example. I realized at one point, I was like, my social life sucks. I don't see anyone. And I was like, hang on a second. I don't, don't do anything to make my social life good. So why am I surprised? Um, so I was like, well, every week, if I just make sure we are actively inviting 
a social event once a week, then over a year, that's 52 social events and my social life will likely be better. And sure enough, when we brought this into our weekly meeting, guess what happened? I had an improved social life. Crazy. Um, but okay. this is very much the story of my life. I've been someone who's been like, okay, well, if we tweak the system and the routine and the habits, like the outcomes over time greatly change. And it's just always served me very well. So when, when we talk about daily ones that I think have had a huge impact on me, so one would be I read. I read every day. I love books. Um, it's just something that's grown on me. I, I, I'm a ferocious reader. I do that every morning. First one I get up, I have a cup of coffee and I read. Um, the second one is definitely exercise. Um, an avid cyclist, something that you guys get a lot of in France, um, mm. the mecca of the world. But um, endurance sports has been something that has just had a really good effect on me. I know I can't classify it as meditation. Like the true meditators out there will tear me to shreds on that. But there's something that is very uh, grounding and good for my mind when I ride. So that's a daily activity for me. And I, I don't go crazy or fast as some of these pros do, but it's a very enjoyable activity. And then I'd probably say the last one I've gotten into more regularly is I, I write every day. So I'm constantly trying in the habit of creating um, either content or it might be just writing in general. I found that to be really beneficial for me as well. Okay. And so do They're you cycle three. every day? Do you cycle every day? Absolutely. And how, lo how long would you cycle for? Maybe an hour. And just to put some ideas around that is like some days I go fast, like really fast. And then other days it's walking pace, just cruising. Right. Have a look around. So um, I've got to balance that, otherwise, obviously, you can get very burnt out. Yeah. So I mean, because when you talk about, it, I'm, sorry, I'm just interested because it's it's something that I I do. I don't do it every day, but I mean, when you say you cycle for an hour, but it's not an hour. It's actually because you got to get ready, and then you got to you know afterwards you got to shower and you got to do all that. So it's more like two hours. And how you manage to actually integrate that into every day. Yeah, so that like you, you were pretty much going through my morning routine. So I get up early, read for that bit, onto the bike, do the hour, come back and shower, spend some time at my desk writing or creating in some way. And I, I might write content, as I said, or I might write up a business idea. Like I just write or record or do something with content. Um, and that's like how I lead into my day every day. Now, I've just like when you look at the compound effect, and this is where I'm at, when you look at those activities, if you compound them over a year, you get a really big benefit a huge benefit in life overall so that's how i've just chosen to go about it charlie that that is fantastic where can people reach you and reach out to you and understand more about your business and what you do i know we would come back and do another podcast about the podcast but for uh for the moment where can people get in touch with you so head over to valamedia.com and then of course if you just search my name charlie valor on any social network you'll find me very quickly there as well OK, and we will have all of that in the show notes. Charlie, thank you so much for giving me a lot of your time. I really appreciate it. It's been fascinating and it's been very educational. I'm sure that people listening will just have, will have taken an awful lot from it. Oh, thank you for having me, John. My pleasure.